The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, let's get started. Today's all about Lagrange we'll, method. We will talk a lot about what we really mean by generalized coordinates and generalized forces, and then do a number of application examples. There's a set of notes on Stellar on the Lagrange method. It's about 10 pages long, and I highly recommend you you read them. They're, they're, they, they're not somehow up with the notes associated with lecture notes. They're kind of in a, way down at the bottom. So you have to scroll all the way down in the Stellar website to find them. The, uh, there's, our second quiz is November 8th. That's a week from next Tuesday. Okay, Pretty much same format as uh, the first one. OK, so let's talk about how to use Lagrange equations. <clears throat> so I defined what's called the Lagrangian last time, T minus V, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy of the entire system, total kinetic and total potential energy expressions. Then we have a, some quantities. QJs, these are defined as the generalized forces, generalized dis coordinates, I should say. And the capital Q sub Js are the generalized forces. Okay. And the Lagrange equation says that d by dt, the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to the q, j dots, the velocities, minus the, par minus the partial derivative of L with respect to the generalized displacements equals the generalized forces. And in, for a typical system, you'll have a number of degrees of freedom, like, say, three. And if you have three degrees of freedom, you need three equations of motion. And so the, year, the j's will go from one to three in that case. So the j's here refer to an indice that gives you the number of equations that you need. So you do this calculation for coordinate one again for coordinate two, again for coordinate three, and you get then three equations of motion. OK. So this <clears throat> is a little, a little obscure. I like to, let's just plug in for L equals T minus V, and just put it in here and see what happens. get d by dt of the partial of t with respect to q j dot minus d by dt of the partial of v with respect to q j dot plus Organize it this way. Minus the partial of T with respect to Q J plus the partial of V with respect to Q J equals capital Q J. Now, when we first talked about potential energy a few days ago. We said that for mechanical systems, the potential energy is not a function of time or 
Anybody remember? Velocity. So if the potential energy is not a function of time, but velocity, what will happen to this term? Because it's, this goes away. So this is zero for mechanical. systems. You know, if you start getting into electrons moving in magnetic fields, then you start having potential energies involving velocities. But for mechanical systems, this term's zero. And I think the bookkeeping, though, uh, so this is the form of Lagrange equations that I write down when I'm doing problems. I don't write this. Mathematicians like, you know, elegance. And this comes down to this is beautifully elegant, simple looking formula. But I'm an engineer, and I like it to be efficient you know, and, pr and practically useful. This is the practically useful form of Lagrange equations. So you just use what you need. Poten kinetic energy here, kinetic energy there, potential energy there. And I number these. There's a lot of bookkeeping in Lagrange. So I call that term one, term two, term three, and term four. Because you have to grind through this quite a few times, and so when you do, Basically, you take one, the results of one, plus two, plus three, equals four, and you do that uh, j times to get the equations you're after. Okay. So a little, now we need to talk a little bit about what we mean by generalized coordinates, qj. General, what, you know, what's this word generalized mean? Generalized just means it doesn't have to be Cartesian. Not necessarily Cartesian, as in x, y, z. You have a lot of liberty in how you choose coordinates. Not necessarily Cartesian, uh, not even um, inertial. They do have to satisfy certain requirements. The coordinates, they must be what we call independent. They must be complete. And so they must be independent and complete. And the system must be holonomic. Now I'll get to that in a minute. So we need to, you need to understand what it means to be independent, complete, and holonomic. by independent. So if you have a multiple degree of freedom system and you fix all but one of the coordinates, you say a system can't move in, in all but one of its coordinates, that last degree of freedom still has to have a complete range of motion. So if you have a double pendulum and you grab the first mass, the second mass can still move. It takes two angles to define your double pendulum. So independent when you fix all but one coordinate. Still 
have a continuous range of movement. In essentially in the free coordinate. And that's independence. And we'll just we'll just kind of use the we'll we'll uh, do this by example mostly. And complete the to complete really means that's capable of locating all parts of the system at all times. So let's think about, let's look at the system here. It's double pendulum. It's a simple one, just made out of two particles and strings. I should have, didn't bring one today. And I could, uh, I need to pick some coordinates to describe this. Okay, and we'll put this in a, uh, we'll use some Cartesian coordinates here, say an X and a Y. And here's particle one. And I can choose to describe this system, uh, X, Y coordinates, and I'll specify the location of the system with coordinates X1 and Y1, two values to specify the location of that. And I'm down here, I'm going to pick two more values, x2 and y2, to, to describe the, uh, so these are, the x1 is a different coordinate from x2. x1 is the x position of particle 1. x2 is the x position of particle 2, y1 and y2, okay? So how many coordinates do I have to describe the system? How many have I used? Four, right? How many degrees of freedom do you think this problem has? Two, right? So there's something already a little out of whack here. Um, <clears throat> OK. But the point is, these aren't independent, you'll find. You just do a test to find that these aren't independent. If I fix x1 and x2, systems doesn't move, right? I say this has got to be one, and this has got to be three. That it, this system is now frozen. So this system of core coordinates is not independent. What do we say? Independent. When you fix all but one coordinate, you still have continuous range of movement of the final one. I can fix only just two of these, and I've frozen the system. I don't even have to go to the extent of fixing three. I'm assuming the strings are of uh, fixed length. You can't change the string length, OK? So this is not a very good choice of coordinates. And we had a hint that it might not be, because it's more than we ought to use. We only really need two. OK, so and then if we choose these angles, phi 1 and phi 2, let's do the test with that. Are those independent? So if those are the coordinates of the system, if you fix phi 1, is there still free and continuous movement of phi 2 of the system? Sure. And if you fix V2, which means you can require this angle stay rigid like that, and move V1, well, the whole system will still move. So V1 and V2 are a system which satisfies the independence requirement. Complete, they're both systems are complete. They're both capable of locating all points at all times. Okay. But only the pair phi 1 and phi 2 in this example are both independent and complete. Now, the third requirement is this thing called holon holonomicity. And what, holono what it means to be holonomic is that the system, the number of degrees of freedom required, 
is equal to the number of, re uh, number of coordinates required to completely describe the motion. Now, I, most of the time, every example we've ever done so far in this class satisfies that. We pick V1 and V2, and that's all the coordinates that we need to completely describe the motion. Let me see if I can figure out a, uh, a counterexample. So I, did, I, I didn't write down this definition. So holonomic. And if the answer to this question is no, you cannot use Lagrange equations. So let's see if I can show you an example of a system in which you need more coordinates than you have degrees of freedom. So I've got a ball. It's on the X, this is an XY plane. And the, I'm not going to allow it to translate in Z and I'm not going to allow it to rotate about the z-axis. So I'm I've put, I've, those are two constraints, right? So this is one rigid body. How, in, how many, in general, how many degrees of freedom does it have? Six. OK. I'm going to constrain it, so no z-motion, five. No z-rotation, four. I'm not, it's, it's not going to allow it to slip this is x, and that's y. I'm not going to allow it to slip in the x. So now I've got another. That's one mound down to three. And I'm not going to allow it to slip in the y, two. So that by our calculus of how many degrees of freedom you need, we're down to two. We should be able to describe, completely describe the motion of this system with two coordinates. OK. So I've got this, put this piece of tape on the top. And it's pointing diagonally that way. And I'm going to roll this ball like this until it shows up again. So it's right on top, just the way it started. Okay. Now, let's start off the same way again. I'm going to roll first this way. And then I'm going to roll this way to the same place. Where's the stripe? It's in the back. So I've gone to the same position, but I've ended up with the ball not in the same orientation as it was. I went by two different paths. And the ball comes out over here rather than up there where it started. OK, so this system, actually, to actually describe where the ball is at any place out here, having gotten there by running around, rolling around without slipping and without Z rotation, how many coordinates do you think it'll take to actually specify where that stripe is at any arbitrary place that it's gotten to on the plane? Name them. So you got, in order to actually fully describe it, you've got to say where it is, x and y, and you actually have to say some kind of theta and phi rotations that it's gone through so that you know where this is. Okay? So this system is not holonomic. And holonomic, it has to be holonomic in order to, be, in order to use Lagrange equations. Okay. So when you go to do Lagrange problems, you need to test for is your coordinates complete, independent, and holonomic. And you get pretty good at it. So you
So here's my Lagrange equations. And I've itemized these four calcul calculations you have to do, column one, two, three, and four. Okay. And so what I just want, what I want to write out is just to show you, it's just to get you to adapt a systematic approach to doing Lagrange. So left-hand side. So the left-hand side of your equations of motion is everything with T and V. The right-hand side is, has these generalized forces that you have to deal with. And the generalized forces are the non-conservative forces in the system. OK, so this is going to get a little bit cookbook, but it's, I think, you, appropriate for the moment here. So step one. Determine the number of degrees of freedom that you need. And choose your delta j's. Those are your, not deltas, excuse me, just q j's. Choose your coordinates. You find the number of degrees of freedom and choose the coordinates you're going to use, basically. Verify, complete, independent, holonomic. Three, compute T and V for every rigid body in the system. Compute your kinetic and potential energies. One, two, three. For each QJ. So for every coordinate you have, you have to go through these computations, one, two, three, four, for every coordinate. And this is your left-hand side. And if you don't have any external forces, any non-conservative external forces, then one, two, one plus two plus three equals zero. But if you have non-conservative forces, then you have to compute the right-hand side. So the right-hand side. So for each QJ, each generalized coordinate, you need to find the generalized force that essentially goes with it. And you do this by computing the virtual work delta w. I'll put the little nc up here to remind you these are for the non-conservative forces. The delta w associated. with the virtual displacement delta qj. So for every generalized coordinate you have, you're going to try out this little delta, Q, delta of motion in that coordinate and figure out how much um, virtual work you've done. So, so delta Wj is going to be Qj delta J. So whatever, the, this is the thing you're looking for. And it's going to be a function of all those external non-conservative forces acting through a little virtual displacement. A little bit of work will be done.
Mostly I'm going to teach you how to do this by, just by example. So let's quickly do a really simple trivial system. Our mass spring dash pot system, single degree of freedom, M, K, B. It's going to take one coordinate to describe the motion. X happens to be Cartesian. There'll be one generalized coordinate. So Q, J equals Q, 1 equals Q, X in this case. It's our X coordinate. Actually, I should just call it X. That's our generalized coordinate for this problem. Is it complete? Yep. Is it independent? Yes. Is it holonomic? No problem. OK. We need T, 1 half M x dot squared, we need v, and we have 1 half k x squared for the spring, plus, minus mgx for the gravitational potential energy. And now we can start, uh, and we have some external non-conservative forces. What are they? Fi non-conservative. And I think I'll better, I'm going to put an excitation on here too, some f of t. So what are the non-conservative forces? Jonathan. Pardon? K, x dot. Not k, but. <coughs> oh, I wrote, I, it, my mistake, sorry about that. You're correct. I'm just, uh, my brain is getting ahead of my writing here. That's normally B, and this would be K. I'm not trying to really mess you up there. So what would that, it would be BX dot, right? OK. My, and is there anything else? Are there any other non-conservative forces, things that can put energy into or out of the system? So the damper can certainly extract energy. Yeah, the force F. That external, it might be you know, something that's making it vibrate or whatever. But it's an external force, and it could do work on the system. And it's not necessarily a, it's not a potential. It's not a spring, and it's not, a, it's not gravity. It's coming up and somebody's shaking it or something like that. So F is also non-conservative. So the non-conservative forces in this thing are uh, F in the i direction and minus bx dot in the i direction. And we could, in our normal approach using Newton, we draw a free body diagram. And we, ad we identify a bx dot on it and an f on it. But we'd also have our kx on it. That would be what our free body diagram would look like. And the non that's a conservative force. Oops, and we need an mg. So we have two conservative forces, Kx and Mg, and we have two non-conservative forces, Bx dot and F. So in this case, the non some of the non-conservative forces is the F in the I direction minus Bx in the I, X dot in the I direction. So let's do our calculus here. So 1 d by dt of the partial of the t, which is 1 half mx dot squared with respect to x dot. So that gives me the derivative of x dot squared with respect to x dot gives me a 2mx dot. So this is d by dt of mx dot, but that's m x double dot. And as you might expect, when you're trying to drive equation of motion, you're probably going to end up with an mx double dot in the result. And it always comes out of these d by dt expressions. OK, so that's term one. <coughs> term two in this problem, minus t with respect to x in this case. Is t a function of x? Any 
it says one half m x dot squared, but it, so is t a function of displacement x? It's a function of velocity in the x direction, but is it a function of displacement? No. So this term is zero. Three, our third term, partial of v with respect to x. Ah. Well, where's v? Half kx squared. The derivative of this is kx minus mg. Okay, and we sum those. So we get mx double dot plus kx minus mg equals, and on the right hand side, this is 4. Now we need to do 4 for the right hand side. And 4 is really the summation of the fi's, the individual forces, dotted with d r. These are both vectors. dr is the movement. It's a little bit of work and it's going to be a delta quantity like delta x. And f are the applied forces. And you need to sum these up. So this dr in general is going to be a function of the delta j's, the virtual displacements in all the possible degrees of freedom of the system. We do them one at a time. In this case, we only have one, so it's trivial. But this could be you know, a delta 1, 2, 3, 4. And each one of them might do some work when f moves through it. But work is f dot the displacement. So it's the component of the force in the direction of the movement, the dot product, that gives you this little bit of virtual work. OK, so in this problem, this is going to be equal to, we actually have an f of t, some function of time, in the i direction, minus b x dot in the i direction, dotted with delta x, which is our virtual displacement in our single generalized coordinate. And this whole thing is going to be equal to q x delta x. So you figure out the virtual work that's done. So delta, so if you do this dot product, this is also in the i hat direction. So i dot i, i dot i, you just get ones because the forces are in the same direction as the, dis, as the displacement. You're going to get an f t f of t delta x is one of the little bits of virtual work. And you'll get a minus bx dot delta x. And that together, those two pieces added together, are the generalized force times delta x. This total here gives you delta w non-conservative for, in this case, coordinate x. So we need to, we're trying to solve for the, what goes on the right-hand side. We need the qx. So we have here, you notice what will happen. You'll divide, it'll cancel out the delta x's that result. And in this case, what you're left with is qx equals f of t minus bx dot. So this is number four. So qx delta x is the bit of virtual work that's done. What goes into our equation of motion is the qx part. And we got it by computing the virtual work done by the applied external non-conservative forces as we imagine them going through delta x. And we're done. And you have the complete equation of motion for a single degree of freedom system. You could rearrange it a little bit. mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx equals 
mg plus f of t, if you will. So it's the same thing you would have gotten from, saying, from using Newton in a, you know, in a trivial kind of example, but it helps define each of the steps, things that we said were required. OK, so we're going to go from there to a much harder problem. So any issues or questions about definitions? Procedure. So when you start getting into multiple degrees of freedom, you need to set up a careful bookkeeping. So I, I, I just do this myself. Then I, I, top of the page, I identify my coordinates. I write down T, write down V. Then I say, OK, coordinate one. One, two, three, four. Equation. Then I start with the coordinate two. Calculus for one, two, three, and four and so forth until you get to the end. OK, questions? Yeah? Um, on the line to the fourth circle, um, what's that thing after the DR? Is like an open parentheses and then the DJ? Oh, I, these are functions of the, of the delta Js. This, de, this DR, where it comes from, the work that's being done in the virtual displacement around a dynamic equilibri equilibrium position for the system is a little movement of the system, dr. And we express it. It's expressed in terms of the generalized, a virtual displacement of the generalized coordinates of the system. So where the dr comes from is going to be delta. In this case, it's only delta x. And in the next problem we're going to do, the force in the problem is not in exactly the same direction as the delta x's and delta thetas and so forth. So when you do the dot product, only that component of the force that's in the direction of the virtual displacement does work. And you, you account for that. So let's, let's uh, look into a more di difficult problem. So the problem is this. I tried, to, I, I tried to fix this up before I came to class. And I really didn't really quite have the, the uh, parts and pieces I needed. But this is a piece of, just a piece of steel pipe here. It's a sleeve on the outside of this rod. And I've got a spring that's on the outside connected to this piece. And so it can do this. OK? And it's also, though, a pendulum. So the system I really want to look at is this system. So as it swings back and forth, the thing slides up and down. So this has multiple sources of kinetic energy, multiple forms of uh, potential energy. Okay, And I'll, for the purpose of the problem, I'm going to say that there's a force that's always horizontal acting on this mass pushing this system back and forth. Some f cosine omega t, always horizontal. And I want to drive the equations of motion of the system. So is it a planar motion problem? All right. How many rigid bodies involved? OK. So in, you know, for, so there's, two, there's two rigid bodies. Each could have possibly six degrees of freedom. But when you say it's uh, planar motion, you're actually immediately confining each rigid body to three. Each rigid body can move x and y and rotate in z. So the number, when you spread out and out say this is planar motion, you've just said each rigid body has max three. So this has a maximum of six possible. Right? No, the other, where the th other three disappear too is no z deflection and no rotation in the x or y. OK, so we have a possible, uh, possible maximum six. How many degrees of freedom does this problem have? How many coordinates will we need to completely describe the motion of the system? So come up, so think about that. Talk to a neighbor, decide on the coordinates that we need to use for this system and while I'm drawing it.
Okay. What do you decide? How many? Two. All right. What would you recommend? What would you choose? Pardon? The angle and the uh, upward elevation. An angle and a deflection of what I'm calling M2 here? OK. So this is M2. The rod is M1. And he's suggesting an angle, theta, and a deflection, which I'll call x1. And I've attached to this bar, the rod I'm calling it, a rotating coordinate system, x1, y1, about point a, so A, X1, Y1 is my rotating coordinate system attached to this rod. Okay. So I'm going to locate the position of this by some value X1 measured from point A and locate the position of the rod itself by an angle theta. Good. Is it complete? So if you freeze one, do you still have uh, the complete? Is it com again, did it describe the motion at any possible position? Those two things, yes. Is it independent? If you freeze x, can theta still move? If you freeze theta, can the x still move? OK, is it whole and only? Right, two equals, you know, you need two, we got two. And they're independent and complete. Good. So now the harder work starts. So I'm going to give us the mass of the rod, the mass moment of inertia of the rod about the z-axis. But with respect to A, the length of the rod is L1. The sleeve, mass M2, G, G, IZZ with respect to its G. So it has a G. They, there's also, and I better call it G2. That's the G of the sleeve. There's also a G1, a uh, center of mass for the rod and a center of mass for the sleeve. We, those are properties that we'll need to know. We, and I'll give them to you. OK, so we need to come up with expressions for potential energy and kinetic energy. So but this, this problem, the kinet potential energy, is a little messy because you have to pick references. You have to account for the unstretched length of the spring. All right. So uh, call L0 is the un. stretched spring length. Give it, we know that also. So I propose that the potential energy look like one half, for the spring anyway, one half the amount that it stretches in a movement x1. The amount that it stretches then should be whatever that x1 position is. And that x1 position and I have just, I drew it slightly incorrectly. I'm going to use x1 to locate the center of mass, which is always a good practice. So here's the center of mass. So my x1 goes to the center of mass. OK, that's x1. So that's the, that's the total distance. And from that, we need to subtract L0, the unstretched length of the spring. And we need to subtract half the length of the body because it's going that, that's that extra bit here. Okay. So this is the amount that the string is actually stretched when you go through a motion, when there's motion, when the coordinate is x1. And you've got to square that, and that would be the kinetic, excuse me, the potential energy stored in the spring. And then we've got to do the same thing for the uh, potential energy, we have two sources of potential energy and they, and due to gravity, and they are two objects, right? Two potential energies. So why don't you take a minute and tell me the potential energy associated with the rod. So the rod has a center of mass, and the center of, it's a pendulum, basically. So it's the same as all the pendulum problems you've ever seen. 
And I would recommend that we use as our reference position its static equal, its equilibrium position hanging straight down. And I'm going to, I'll tell you in advance, I'm going to use the unstretched spring position this time. I just stay with that. That's where it's going to start from. That's my reference for potential energy. But does, this, does this, has the unstretched spring position have anything to do with the potential energy of the rod? No. OK, so its reference position is just hanging straight down. So figure it out. What's the, give me a potential energy expression for just the rod part. Think about that. So I'm, I'm going to remind you about something about potential energy. Potential energy, one of the requirements about it is the change of potential energy from one position to another is path independent. So you don't actually ever have to do the integral of you know, minus mg dot dr. You don't have to do the integral. You just have to account for the change in height between its starting position and its some other position. So spend a minute or two thinking about that. Work it out. You got a question? Okay. Talk, talk to a neighbor, check your ideas, and then So you have a suggestion for me? <laughs> Ladies? Sure. Yeah. Huh? Oh. It would be L1 over 2 plus L1 over 2. Okay. Um, any, anybody want to make an improvement on that? Or like, they like it? Improvement? One minus cosine theta. So uh, let's put that up and let's figure out if, if we need that. So it could be cos we have a, a bid for cosine theta and one minus cosine theta. <clears throat> so you need to have a potential energy at the reference and you need to have a potential energy at the final point. And the difference between the two is a change in potential energy here, okay? So what's the reference potential energy is mg L1 over 2 when it hangs straight down. And then when it moves up to this other position, this is the, the L1 over 2 times this is delta H. This is the change in height that it goes through. So you need the 1 minus, right? And why is it? Uh, and do we have the signs right? Yeah. OK. So now we need another term, and I'll write this one down. We need a, it's a little, this one's a little messier. We need a potential energy term due to gravity for the sleeve. And that's going to mimic this. You're going to have a term here plus m2g, and its reference, I'm just going to do it as a reference amount minus the final amount. The reference will be at the initial location of its center of mass, which is L0 plus L2 over 2 minus m2g x1 
cosine theta. Okay, because this, this one gets a little messier because you got this thing. It can move up and down the sleeve. And if that moves, you've lost your reference. So you can't do this as a concise little term like this. You have to separate out the reference, and then this is the final. And the, the, and the L0 plus L2, this quantity here is the initial starting height. This x1 cosine theta is the finishing height. And the difference between the two gives you the change in the potential energy. So this is your potential energy expression. This plus this plus these. All right. So what about T? We ought to be able to write it. Kinetic energy is generally easier. You've got to account for all the parts and pieces. So we have two chunks. And we're going to have rotational kinetic energy associated with the rod, rotational kinetic energy associated with the sleeve, but also some translational kinetic energy associated with the sleeve, right? And I'll write these terms down. I've, when I've made the, make the problem go a little faster here. <clears throat> One half IZZ about A. For that's the first, that's the rod, plus a half IZZ for the sleeve, about G. And we'll discuss why the difference here. And that's theta dot squared. Now for the Kinetic energy that comes from translation of the center of mass. Because I've broken up. I've accounted for, this is a, <clears throat> let me start over. This system is pinned about A. And, and the rod is just simply pinned at A. And that, the last lecture I put up these different conditions and simplifications. You can account for a something about a fixed pin by computing mass moment of inertia about A. It's basically a parallel axis theorem argument, times 1 half times that times theta dot squared. So this gives you all of the kinetic energy in one go with the rod. But for the sliding mass, because its position is changing, you can't do that. You have to account for the two components of its but kinetic energy separately. This accounts for rotation about G, even though G is moving. That accounts for that energy. This accounts for, because it's only a function of theta dot, it's not a function of that position x. This account, this term is going to account for then the kinetic energy associated with the movement at the center of mass. So we need a V, G to, in the inertial frame, dot V, G to. these being vectors. And does that get everything? I think that does. So VGO is, it certainly has a component that is its speed sliding up and down the rod, right? And that's in the I hat direction. But it has another component due to what? And can you tell me what it is? It's contribution to its speed due to its rotation. It's got a theta dot, yep. And it's got an, it needs an R, right? Yeah, so this would be an x1 plus. Uh, no, actually, I made x1 go right to the, uh, so just x1 theta dot. In what direction? Yeah, so j hat here, right? The moving, it's actually, that's the moving, 
coordinate system unit vector in the y direction. And so we do the dot, the, do the dot product, you get this times itself, i dot i and j dot j, you get that uh, this quantity here is 1 half m2 x dot squared plus x, this next one, I guess, x1 squared theta dot squared. That's the kinetic energy of accounting for the velocity of the center of mass. So now we have our entire kinetic energy expression. So now we have how many coordinates? Two, right? How many times do we have to turn the crank and go through the Lagrangian system? You got to go through it twice. So let's apply Lagrange here. And we'll just do number one first. So and let's, and let's see, which one do I have in my paper first? I guess we'll do the x1 equation. This is delta x1. So this is generalized coordinate x1. And we need to do term one, which is then d by dt of partial of t with respect to x1 dot. OK. So we look at this and say, well, we got to go, is this a function, is this term a function of x, of x? Nothing. So you get nothing from there. Uh, is this term a function of x? Yeah, it's down here. So we just, this, we only have to take the derivative of this. We have to do that job, okay? So the derivative of this with respect to x dot, you get a 2x dot here. Do you get anything from here? When you do this with the derivative with respect to x dot, you only get a contribution from here. The 2 cancels that. And so this should look like m2 x1 dot, but d by dt. And I'll, I won't do this. Do this once in two steps here so you see where, what happens. You get an m2 x1 double dot out of that. OK. <coughs> Let's, so we've gotten the first, the first piece of this. We've got a couple to go. But I want you, you know a lot about Newton's laws. And you know a lot about calculating equations of motion now using sum of torques and all that, all that stuff, right? So this is just something moving, has angular, it has circular motion, has translational motion. What other accelerations had better appear in this equation of motion? And we're get, we, you know, which equation are we getting? And there's going to be two equations, and they have sort of physical significance to it. What equation is beginning to look like? Just physically, what movement is being accounted for here? Looks like translation in the x direction. It's this thing sliding. It's this part of the motion, sliding up and down. There's, you're writing an equation of motion, and mx double dot has units of what? Torque? Force. So this is a force equation. This is just F equals MA is what this, what this is going to show us. Remember, the direct method has to give you the same answer as Lagrange. So we're getting a force equation. It's describing MX double dot. What other, what other acceleration terms do you expect to appear in this from what you know? Yeah. A centripetal term. Do you believe there ought to be a centripetal term in this answer? Why? Because it's got circular motion involved, for sure. Any others? Is there any Coriolis in this? In this direction? Which direction are we working in? Is there Coriolis acceleration in the x direction? This, by the way, these equations, do we have any IJKs in here? These are pure scalar equations. No vector, no unit vectors involved. So this equation only describes motion in the x. So will there be a Coriolis force in this acceleration in this problem? 
Will there be an Eulerian acceleration in this equation of motion? The reason I'm going through this is I want you to start developing your own intuition about whether or not when you get, the, get it at the end, it's got everything it ought to have and doesn't have stuff it shouldn't have. Right? OK, so the, you're forecasting that we better get a centripetal term. Well, let's see what happens. So that was number one. Number two here is our dt by minus dp minus the derivative of the, with respect to x in this case. So we go here x1, we've been calling it. Is this a function of x, this piece? Nope, it's x dot. How about this one? Right, take this derivative, you get 2x. So this fellow is going to give us minus the m2 x1 theta dot squared. Hmm. What's that look like? There it is. There's your centripetal term that you're expecting to get. Okay. And step three is plus partial of v with respect to x. Right. In this case, with respect to x. And where's our potential energy expression? Well, it's up here. And where are the x dependencies in it? There is. No x in that term and no x in that term, but we have x's in both of these other terms, right? So when we grind through this, I'll write down what we uh, come up with. We get a, certainly a spring term, k x1 minus l0 minus l2 over 2. So that's the spring piece when you take the derivative. The 2 cancels the half, and the derivative of the parts inside just gives you 1. So that's the first piece of the potential energy expression. And the second piece is only going to come from here. The derivative of this respect to x1 is just mg, m2g cosine theta minus. And you add those bits together, you sh end up with m2 x1 double dot minus m2 x1 theta dot squared plus k x1 minus l0 minus l2 over 2 minus m2 g cosine theta. So those are the three terms, 1 plus 2 plus 3, that go on the left-hand side. And they're going to equal my q x that I find. But I still now have to find what the generalized force is in the x direction. So it's all left to do for this problem is to find q sub x, the generalized force that goes on the right-hand side. So now let's draw a little, little diagram here of my system. And at the end of the sleeve, so here's my sleeve, I've applied this force. This is f of t. Maybe it's some um, f uh, not cosine omega t. It's an oscillatory force, external force. Make it vibrate. And I need to know the virtual work done making that force go through a displacement in what direction? So this equation is the x1 equation, right? And so the virtual displacement I'm talking about is delta x1. And the amount of work that it does is delta x1 times the component of this force that's in its direction. So I'm going to take 
this force and break it up into two components. And if this is my theta, this is also theta. So this will be F naught, and I'll leave out the cosine omega t here. It's a function of time, but this side then is cosine theta i. No, hey, I got this wrong. I drew this wrong, I'm sorry. This is theta. This is going to be sine. This side is sine theta in the i direction, and this piece is f naught of t cosine theta in the j. So I break it up in two parts, and the virtual work associated with x1 is the thing I'm looking for, qx, dotted with delta x1, and that is f of t here, the vector, dotted with dr, my little displacement. But in this case, this then all works out to be f not cosine omega t. And it has sine theta i plus cos theta j components dotted with delta x in the i. So you're only going to get i dot j gives you 0, i dot i gives you 1. So you're going to get one piece out of this. This says then that qx equals f naught cosine omega t sine theta, and that's, uh, and this start with, you know, you have a delta x here and a delta x here, and that gives you the delta virtual work. Then to solve, to find, that you need, I need, personally, when I do these problems, I think in terms of that little virtual deflection, and I actually figure out what's the virtual work done, and then at the end, I take this out, and this is the qx that I'm looking for. So my final equation of motion says this equals f naught cosine omega t sine theta. And that's your equation of motion in the x1 direction. So when you, when, you, when you finish one of these, you need to ask yourself, does this make sense? You know, does this jive with my understanding of Newtonian physics? Better have a linear acceleration term, because that's what it's doing. You have another acceleration term in the same direction due to centripetal, a spring force for sure, and a component of gravity in the direction of motion down this, up and down the slide, equal to any external forces in that direction. So it makes pretty good sense. OK. Now, also another test you can do is, does it satisfy the laws of statics? That's another check you can perform. This, what's, does this thing at static equilibrium tell the truth? At static equilibrium, all time derivatives are 0. So this would be 0, this would be 0. You know at static equilibrium hangs down, so cosine theta is 1. Static, you don't have any time-dependent forces. That's 0. So the static part of this says that says that k x1 minus l0 minus l2 over 2 equals m2g cosine and that's cosine theta is 1 so it's m2g and you can figure out then this must be k times something, this is the x, this is the amount that the spring stretches, the static stretch of the spring. 
so that it's equal to, the spring has an equal opposite force to the weight of the thing M2G. So that's another check you can do when doing the problems. OK, so I want you, I'll, pro I'll write up the final, an the, the other one. We have one more equation to go, right? Got to do the, all the derivatives with respect to theta. So do you take a minute to decide well, how many terms, how many acceleration terms, and what acceleration terms do you expect to see come out of this second equation of motion? Because now we're talking about which motion? The swinging motion. And what's its direction? It's, you know, in the in Newtonian sense, it would have a vector direction. It's in the in what we call J here. OK, so you're about to get the J equation. What, ex, what terms do you expect to find in it? Talk to your neighbors and sort this out. Tell me what the, basically, tell me what the answer is going to be. What do you think? What are we going to get? Um, we were debating about whether or not it was going to be like speeding up in the data path. So it's a pen it, it, it is a pendulum, just a weird pendulum. So uh, is there? So the does this, does the theta change speed? Sure. When it gets up the top, it's swing at zero. All the way down, it's maximum speed. So what terms do you so what terms does that imply that you're gonna get? Part well. well, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. You're gonna get an Eulerian, which means you got a theta double dot term. You're, you're expecting a theta double dot term to show up? Okay. What else? Will you get a Coriolis term? Do you expect a Coriolis term? Something that looks like x dot theta dot. Yeah, the thing is sliding up and down the sleeve. It has a non-zero value of x dot. Anytime you've got things moving radially while something is swinging in a circle, you will get Coriolis forces. It means the angular momentum of that thing is changing, and it takes forces to make that happen. So here's what this. Uh, answer looks like that's the one term the two piece gives you zero not a function of, of uh, x in the three piece, the potential energy piece gives you m2g x1 sine theta plus m1g l1 over 2 sine theta. And the fourth piece, the q theta, well, that's just going to be the virtual work done. There's a tricky bit to this one. Now there's virtual work, but which direction? So we have an F dot a dr. The only F we have is this. What's the dr? What direction is it? This is the theta coordinate. What direction does that give you displacements? F Dot dr is a displacement, not an angle. To get the work done, you've got to move a force through a distance. So the distance, first of all, is in what direction when theta moves? G 
little j hat, right? And how much, if now, if you get a virtual deflection of delta theta, what's the virtual displacement? You get a virtual change in angle delta theta, but is that the virtual displacement? What's the displacement of this point here in the j direction, given a virtual displacement delta theta? Think, think that out. Can't quite hear you. X1 delta theta. X1 delta theta will give you the motion, the displacement at the center of mass in that direction. X1 comes from here to here. So X1 delta theta will give you a little displacement in that direction. But is that the delta, that, is that the displacement we care about? We need the displacement here. So you're close. So we're going to get some force dot a displacement dr, and that's going to be our force, this guy, with its i and j components, i and j terms. But this term out here is x1 plus l2 over 2 to get to the end, and it's in the j direction. So it's a length times a, and, and you need the delta. This, this quantity, and you need a delta of theta. Delta theta. This is the term, this is the dr for this system. An angle, a virtual deflection in angle, times a moment arm gives you a distance. It's in the... Uh, J hat direction dotted with the same force, breaking the force up into its I and J components. It had a sine theta I, cos theta J. So this is going to give me a F cosine omega T cos theta J dot J. F naught cosine omega T cos theta x1 plus l2 over 2 delta theta is the delta w. That's the work. And the virtual, or the generalized force, q theta, is this part of it. So this plus this plus this equals that on the right hand side. So this is part four. So this is, is look at it. Yeah. So f of t, you know, I, I, I just I didn't want to write it all out. It, this thing breaks into an i and a j piece, which is written over there. This is the sine theta i, cos theta j term. Which I pulled out, which I brought back from over there, and that, and we dot it with the dr that we care about, which is x1, this length times that angle in the j direction. So j dot, we only pick up the j piece of this, and that gives us this cosine theta term. Okay. Let's look quickly. This is a rotational. Thing. It has units of, is it force? Is this an equation, a force equation? I theta double dot has units of what? Torque. This is a torque equation. This is the, the uh, total mass moment of inertia, IZZ, with respect to A for this system, such that the Eulerian acceleration, the torque it takes to make that happen, is the sum of the mass moment of inertia of the rod plus the mass moment of inertia of g plus m2x1 squared, which is, looks a lot like the parallel axis theorem. This is IZZA for the moving mass. There's your Coriolis term. And here's your potential terms. And there's your external force. OK.
talk more about these things in recitation.